Welcome everyone to our webinar today titled Reclaim Asphalt Pavement brought to you by Ecologic and ARRB. My name is Isabella and I'll be moderating the session today. Next slide please. We plan to go for 60 minutes with time for questions at the end and we'd love to have your input throughout the presentation. So you see here on the slide how to send your questions through. Now we are also following the government guidelines and all coming from our home offices. So fingers crossed, all of our technology works. However, we also have Neva and Susie from ARRB joining in for technology support. Next slide, please. Our presenters today are Tony Alessio, Director, Ecologic, Joe Grobler, Principal Professional Leader, ARRB, Stephen Middleton, Senior Professional Leader, ARRB. Next slide, please. Okay, let's get started and we'll now be hearing from Tony. Okay, thanks very much and, uh, and welcome everyone. Hope you enjoy this presentation. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Ecologic and Recycled First, which is the policy that, uh, that Ecologic is driving. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so a little bit about Ecologic for those of you who don't know about us and why Victoria needs it. Uh, we're a Victorian government initiative where our aim is to optimise the use of recycled and reused materials and we're driving that through Victoria's big build, you know, the in excess of $70 billion worth of, of uh, infrastructure work in road and rail that is going on in Victoria now as we speak. Um, it, it comes at a crucial time for Victoria. Uh, it's worth noting that um, we know that, uh, that China has um, has banned and is stopping to take uh, the import of our waste materials and and that is going to create a, a massive landfill and waste product stockpile issue for the government. Um, an example of that is that uh, in 2017 in Victoria we generated 160,000 tonnes of plastic waste. Of that 160,000 tonne, 110,000 tonnes was offshored to China and to, uh, to Asian markets. That's going to stop and so that's an example of the type of, of issue that we're facing. Over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to see a, a significant increase in the, in the amount of waste that is being generated as well. So coupled with that is this Victorian big build and the, the big build, this $70 billion plus um, a lot of work in, uh, in road transport and rail has a voracious appetite for materials. So, you know, our opportunity is to, um, is to take what is a problem into, into a win, if you like, by taking waste products and recycling and reusing them uh, as road making materials. And our aim at Ecologic is to, is to make that a uniform approach. So at the moment there is recycling done, it's somewhat ad hoc and opportunistic and we want to be really intentional and really deliberate about doing that and using this major transport infrastructure program to do so. Next slide please. One of the ways we're driving that is through the Recycled First policy. This is a government policy aimed at uh, maximising the use of recycled materials in our road transport network. So in the future, bidders on, on major transport projects will be required to demonstrate how they're going to optimise recycled and reused materials. This really intentional and deliberate approach you know, provides the opportunity to create a circular economy and to make sure we're using the, the materials that we currently would otherwise go to waste uh, into valuable and usable road materials. Ecologic supporting that implementation and is really driving that through the big build, but, but using that then as leverage to, to push across all transport infrastructure in Victoria and we'll be helping out the Department of Transport in the near future to also implement the Recycle First policy. So with that little bit of overview, uh, I might hand over to Joe to start to talk about Recycled Asheville today. Thank you, Tony. Um, so in support of the Recycled First policy, there's a number of technologies, recycled material technologies that can be, that can be used and um, including reclaimed asphalt pavement or more commonly known as wrap, which we'll discuss today. You've got crumb rubber, recycled glass and, and some other materials as well. But we'll focus on, on wrap for this particular presentation. So what is wrap? Let's start off there. So it's essentially where you take the old existing asphalt that's been previously placed on the road network and you remove it and you 
um, reuse that reclaimed asphalt pavement. So as you can imagine, that um, wrap is essentially just the original aggregate and binder um, that was placed down as part of the original asphalt mix. And we recover that um, wrap from the pavement typically through um, our resurfacing and the rehabilitation processes. And we then um, stockpile the material and we can then reuse it into new applications, typically asphalt or unbound granular pavement layers. It makes perfect sense because if you think about it, that wrap material um, has the original aggregate. And in this case, it's coast coated with um, the original binder and for the purposes of today's presentation we define binder as either a conventional bitumen or a bitumen that's been modified with a polymer or some some other um, type of modification. So the uh, road owner has originally paid for that um, for that asphalt um, and that aggregate and binder within that asphalt mix so then makes perfect sense to to reuse it rather than than get rid of it when it comes to the end of its life. Key takeaway message from this slide is that asphalt is a hundred percent recyclable. So there's not many construction materials out there that can make that claim. So there's really no reason to to not use your reclaimed asphalt. So asphalt's definitely, um, or wrap is definitely not a new product. It's been around for a while. It was um, both locally and internationally. It was first introduced in local specification in the early 2000s. But at that stage, it was only allowed in relatively um, small percentages in the total asphalt mix, say, say below 10%. But as we know, as if you can increase the quantity of wrap, um, in your asphalt mixes, it can provide um, further economic savings and benefits as well as um, significant sustainable benefits, sustainability benefits. Um, but there's always been that nagging question around what is the impact of using high percentages wrap on the performance of new asphalt mixes. So if you can, um, if, if you consider that your um, wrap material is taken from the road, it um, contains a old typically an old hard oxidized binder and now you blend it with a new asphalt with a new virgin binder and what's the implication of that blending process on the um, performance and future performance of your of your new asphalt. So in 2013 to 16 Ostros together with AWRB undertake a, undertook a research project um, to identify some of those performance implications to assess whether it's feasible, whether there's any risks, as well as developing some guidelines as to how do you go about designing new asphalt mixes with high percentages of wrap. In following that work, there's been a general um, trend around um, the country to allow for increased percentages of wrap, and we'll we'll touch about um, on those percentages in a couple of slides. So important to note here, it's most definitely not a new product. It's been around for a, for a while, so it's got a, a proven history. Um, as an example, for um, in, in Victoria alone, it's estimated that um, we'll be placing about um, 300,000 tonnes of, of wrap material for the upcoming year. However, over the, over the years, we've learned a few things. Um, um, that you need to consider when you would like to use wrap, uh, more specifically in your new asphalt mixes. And most very importantly is how do you go about managing that wrap? If you can imagine, um, wrap's likely to be um, variable um, because it's extracted from existing pavements. So the one night you might be milling off an open graded um, asphalt surfacing with a polymer modified binder. The next night you might be removing a intermediate structural layer with a conventional bitumen and um, and they all make it make its way back to to the supplier's um, facility and become wrapped so you can see that this it's got a um, potential for for a lot of variability because of the the, um, the different materials that you um, that you extract, um, different ages, so um, different pavement ages, 
different binder contents, different types of binders, aggregate grading. So there's a whole heap of things um, that can contribute to the variability in that wrap. So it's important to have appropriate wrap management plans in pros and in um, implemented to ensure a consistent and uniform product that you can then reuse. Um, so those wrap management plans are, are focused on, on providing um, the necessary information um, and processes required um, to how you would go about recovering the wrap from, from the road, how you'd go about um, processing that wrap, screening it, crushing it, then storing it, how do you stockpile um, the wrap, and then also um, the ongoing quality assurance to make sure that you test those wrap stockpiles um, for uniformity and to characterize it so that you can then use it in, in future applications. So it's very important to have appropriate wrap management plans in place. The second is um, your asphalt plant requirements. So different asphalt plants deal with adding wrap in different ways and it's all about heat management. So how do you add the wrap without um, further damaging the, the existing binder um, through the exposure of, of heat? So there's, like I said, different plants does this in different ways and, and subsequently they, they have different limitations. So as an example, a batch plant um, has a typical upper limit for, for the incorporation of wrap of about 30%, whereas your continuous drum mix plants um, can, can go up to 60%. So worth noting there that um, it's no use in, in, in requesting a 40% wrap mix from a plant that cannot necessarily um, supply or manufacture that, um, that um, new asphalt with the high percentage of wrap um, consistently. Something to consider. And then finally, um, also very importantly, is how do you design your asphalt mixes using um, specifically higher percentages of wrap? So we know from the previous Osroads work that by adding um, wrap to your to your new asphalt, there's definitely some interaction that occurs between the wrap binder, um, the original wrap binder, and your new virgin um, binder that's added to the asphalt mix. And that interaction then inevitably results in, in changes to your combined binder properties, uh, more specifically the viscosity of your combined binder, which in turn then will have an impact on, on the properties of your asphalt. So it's important to consider this during your, your mix design process. And there's some test methods and procedures that's currently in place, um, that's been developed and, and, and established nationally, that you can go about how to characterize that wrap binder, um, specifically your binder content and your viscosity. Um, that's the two important properties. And then how do you blend that wrap binder with a new virgin binder? So um, important to consider that it's, especially at your higher percentages, it's not just a matter of, of um, replacing your aggregate with a proportion of wrap. You need to account for that high proportion in your, in your um, combined binder blend. But um, there are processes in place and for your wrap management, plant requirements and binder design, it's all um, very manageable. Then for um, any recycled material, and, and this includes wrap, it's always preferable to, um, to reuse that recycled material in its highest possible uh, value application to extract the maximum value from that recycled material. And for wrap, that would be in um, reusing it into new hot mix asphalt. Um, generally, we separate it into two different categories when we use it in new um, hot mix asphalt. The first is when you um, put in less than, say, 15% wrap, it really does uh, becomes a direct substitution of your aggregate and binder, and it's very much business as usual. However, as you go to your higher percentages of wrap, say greater than 15%, like we, like I mentioned before, then you need to start consider um, how you're going to consider the interaction between your wrap binder and your virgin binder. And there's processes in place for that. It does require some additional testing 
to characterize your app, specifically the viscosity of your app stockpile, but all very, very do doable. Then um, there's some other applications in, in Ashfeld as well, where we can do in situ either hot or cold asphalt recycling, as well as cold plant mixing of the wrap material. So these applications are um, less common in Australia. Um, the technologies um, are, um, are available and have been done um, internationally, but at the moment, um, by far the most commonly used application is back into new hot mix asphalt. So Ecologic um, prepared a very useful reference guide for the use of recycled materials in um, road infrastructure that basically provides an overview of the type of recycled materials that can be used and its typical applications and some considerations. It's a very useful reference guide that I encourage you um, to get hold of. On this slide, we can see a snapshot of, um, of the some, some allowable limits for wrap currently being used in a, a Victoria. And as you can see there for asphalt mixes, the allowable limit ranges between 10% and 50%, depending on the um, mix type and application. Um, worth noting that the Victorian Department of Transport is currently in the process of updating the asphalt specifications, so there's likely to be some some changes to those limits, um, probably upwards. And then um, there's also some opportunity and limits to use it in unbound pavement materials. As you can see there, um, the limits vary between 5 and 50% with the higher percentage of wrap um, allowed in your lower pavement layers. So um, this, this shows us that wrap um, can be used, it's allowed to be used, it's encouraged, there's specifications in place, so there, there's really no reason why, um, why we can't be making um, efficient use of, of our um, reclaimed asphalt pavements. And this brings it to the end of, of my portion of the presentation. I'll hand you over now to Stephen that will go through some of the barriers and opportunities for the use of reclaimed asphalt. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Joe. So, as Joe mentioned, I'll provide a brief overview of the current barriers and opportunities for RAP and also run you through a quick case study. Next slide, please, Joe. So, some of the barriers for, for RAP are the storage requirements of RAP. So, ideally, processed RAP stockpiles should be wall, should be stored in a walled covered area to reduce the moisture effects. The stockpile should also be placed on a sloped pad so that the water drains away. The stockpile should be shaped so that the water drains off the sides and the angles of the sides shouldn't be too steep to prevent possible segregation of the stockpile. The stockpile height should also be controlled to prevent consolidation of the wrap. Um, so given these uh, requirements for storage, you can see that a potential barrier is the storage um, of the wrap, particularly on small sites. But again, as, as Joe mentioned, you know, this is, this is manageable. Um, preparation of, of a wrap management plan, as Joe mentioned, is a requirement um, and, and should detail how the wrap will be used from, from milling right through to production. So there's a bit of administration associated with this. Um, generally, as Joe mentioned, the most common way of introducing wrap is um, by adding the adding the cold wrap to a superheated aggregate. The um, heat is transferred to the uh, wrap, which heats the wrap and reduces the moisture content. So uh, the, wrap should be, the wrap shouldn't be expo exposed to a direct flame as this can damage the binder. This is why wrap storage and mo moisture control is so important because um, to, to try and limit that amount of moisture that you need to get off the wrap by um, heat transfer. So given this heat transfer method, as Joe mentioned, um, the asphalt plant will somewhat dictate the amount of wrap that can go into the mix. And like Joe mentioned, there's um, no point asking for 40% if the plant can't actually do it. Um, with increased wrap contents above 15%, as Joe mentioned, the stiffer binder begins to impact the viscosity of the combined binder and an adjustment is required. 
Um, in order to carry out this adjustment, the wrap binder needs to be extracted and tested using a dynamic shear rheometer or DSR for short. Um, this testing is currently relatively specialised and, and somewhat expensive. Um, but as the industry gets on board with that, that's likely to reduce and um, that there's also a possible opportunity to, to characterise it that I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, management of the supply and demand is also another challenge, um, as Joe mentioned, um, as, as the process wrap should ideally be used, so process wrap should ideally be used as soon as possible after processing, one to limit and control the moisture, but also to ensure the wrap remains free flowing and, and is able to be mixed in, in the plant. So, and storage of unprocessed wrap um, and, and processing, as mentioned, requires some land or relatively large amount of land. So sometimes processing of the, the bulk wrap may not actually be at the, the asphalt manufacturing site. So management of the deliveries is important um, because it's, you don't want to start creating a high wrap mix, um, run out halfway through production, um, which will require potential modifications to not only the percentage of aggregates going in, but potentially also changing the virgin binder um, to, to account for that viscosity uh, change. Next slide, please, Joe. So some of the opportunities, uh, as I mentioned, um, if we get a better understanding or be able to characterize the wrap in terms of the binder content and viscosity may enable the development of um, or may be able to reduce the viscosity testing of the wrap. Um, the way we would do this is to um, characterise the wrap and then determine likely viscosities and then likely um, virgin binders that need to be blended to achieve a target um, virgin binder. Um, so for example, say 23 to 30% wrap um, requires a C170 binder um, to produce a viscosity that would be equal to say at C320. And for a C320 binder, that could be used in 23 to 30% wrap to produce a viscosity equal to a straight C600. So if the, the opportunity is potentially characterizing this wrap to potentially reduce the, um, the wrap viscosity. And that has a similar method has been um, investigated in Queensland currently. Um, as mentioned, with appropriate design and viscosity adjustments, it's possible to increase the levels of wrap up to around 30%, obviously higher depending on the ability of the plant to reduce it. Increasing this, increasing the wrap has the opportunity for cost savings as um, it doesn't require as much uh, virgin binder, which is the most expensive part, but also requires less, less aggregate. And in addition to um, the cost savings, there's also um, the benefit for reducing the demand on re non-renewable resources. Um, so we've got sustainability benefits there. Um, as Joe mentioned previously, wrap is 100% recyclable and with appropriate design can lead to a, a circular economy. Next slide, please, Joe. So now I'll just take you through a quick case study that was um, carried out in Western Australia. Next slide, thanks, Joe. So main roads, Western Australia and Arb, current, uh, complete, current, well, completed a project recently um, under the Western Australian Road Research and Innovation Program for increasing the amount of wrap used in Western Australia. Um, prior to this project, main roads only used 10% wrap in all of their mixes. Um, well, that, that was the maximum allowable wrap. Um, so the project built on the findings from Austroads, um, investigating the, the um, use, high use of RAP. Uh, specifications were developed for the increased use of RAP in intermediate courses in Western Australia. Following this, a project was carried out with industry partners, um, BGC and Downer. Um, they prepared mixes with 20 and 25% RAP, which is a pretty large jump for Western Australia. Uh, viscosity of the wrap was characterised using Austro's test method 192, and then a binder design was carried out using test method, test method 193. Um, 
Each supplier developed wrap management plans for the works and carried out viscosity testing on each wrap lot to verify the viscosity and then carried out um, calculations to ensure the combined binder was within tolerance. One supplier placed over 42,000 tonnes of high wrap asphalt, which equates to about 8,400 tonnes of wrap being placed on that project. Um, as mentioned, the viscosity testing was carried out every 1,000 tonnes. Um, blend calculations were carried out and all the asphalt, um, all the blend viscosity was within the required limits and also the other asphalt properties um, were all conforming as well. In addition to this, um, lab testing was carried out, um, including modulus and fatigue testing on both, both of the supplies mix. And this was compared back to mixes containing no wrap using C600 binder, which was the um, equivalent binder that we were targeting. So the results of the testing indicated that the high wrap mixes were equivalent and comparable to the no wrap mixes. So it indicated to us that the um, viscosity adjustments that we're carrying out through the project should, perform, should produce a mix that is similar and should perform um, the same in the field, if not better. I'll now pass over to Tony to talk about the Mordiali freeway. Sorry, Sorry, Tony. Tony. Just That's on you. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, so, moving on from that West Australian study, we know in Victoria, uh, you saw from the uh, from the guide earlier that we can be at, at higher wrap percentages than than West Australia is moving to. Uh, however, there's still opportunity to to drive and innovate and and move forward in in our use of wrap here in Victoria. And the Mordialic Freeway is a really great example of how we've gone about that. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll have a, bit, a quick look at it. Uh, this freeway project, about nine kilometres, um, uh, linking the Morning Peninsula Freeway to the Dingley Bypass. And, um, uh, and um, um, we've been working closely with the Department of Transport to have a look at the asphalt specification for that, uh, for that bit of pavement. Um, the type SS asphalt, which is the uh, intermediate layer, the structural layer, uh, using a class 600 binder uh, product has been substituted uh, with a product that has 30% wrap using a class 320 binder, an SI layer. Uh, the SS layer has a specification limit of 0% wrap. So we've seen 100,000 tonnes of asphalt for the project, um, producing 30,000 tonnes of reclaimed asphalt being, being used that would otherwise have not been used on that project. So it's a great outcome. Um, and, and to do so, we had to get conditional approval for that particular product. Um, there's some testicle, testing and statistical processing of the wrap stockpiles and the properties that are a bit aligned with what Joe and Steve have been talking about, about getting process control and getting consistency in the product happening. I think there's two really key points out of this, though, that, that are, are worth noting. Firstly, um, to, to achieve this, we needed to work with the standards and specifications uh, arm of the Department of Transport. And in many cases, you know, uh, people will say that the, the standards and specifications are the barrier to increasing the amount of recycling and, and innovative products that come to market. I think this approach shows that um, DOT's um, specifications department, um, uh, the client and, and industry, when they collaborate well, can achieve great outcomes and the door is open to be able to discuss innovation, to discuss uh, continuous improvement, where we can push limits uh, beyond where, where they currently are and do it in a controlled fashion. So I think that's a really positive and really um, worthwhile outcome. I think the other point that, that, that comes from this is that Whilst, whilst this is happening at Morty Alec, uh, it's also happening uh, now on, uh, on a couple of other projects. And my, in my opening address, I talked about uh, being intentional and being deliberate about the use of recycling. And I think the future is that we will take this particular application and turn it into a standard business as usual way of, of delivering um, our infrastructure projects so that it will be built into our standards and specifications. And, and I think that's the difference between having a, a one a one off ad hoc sort of opportunity arise on a project and and making it happen, um, as opposed to turning it into an ongoing 
uh, future future form of delivering transport uh, infrastructure projects in Victoria. So it's a really positive outcome all around for the project and for the future of of, uh, of the big build and and uh, road transport in Victoria. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. We do have a few questions that have come through, um, so I'll start to read them off. Our first one is from Tyler, and Tyler has asked, does the old binder in the wrap sustainability affect the plasticity of unbound pavements? I'll, I'll take on that one. Thank you, Tyler. Um, in short, no. Um, we um, we don't uh, we we haven't seen any changes to to the actual um, plasticity as a result of the of the asphalt binder. Um, what what you obviously need to consider is the um, the combined grading and and the ash the wrap typically doesn't necessarily have the fines proportion as as a conventional. Um, unbound material, so you just got to consider what what the impact is on your on your combined grading. But as far as plasticity goes, no, we we haven't seen any any impact. Thanks, Joe. We've got a question from Angela, and they have asked: Are there any companies providing wrap as part of their service? Would they generally have a wrap management plan already in place? And would there would be there for just to ask for it? And if so, when is appropriate time to ask for it? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so look, um, um, the answer to that is that your major suppliers have um, typically have registered mixes in place, um, so they can um, offer. I can't speak on behalf of them, obviously, but but I am aware that that they can offer. That is uh, mixes with recycled asphalt, um, and um, the wrap management plans is pretty much a requirement in accordance with the specification. So yes, they'll have that in place as well. So it is um, very essential that you, when you do request these mixes, that um, that um, they provide evidence of that wrap management plan, and that it's being adhered to. Um, and typically you would request that information as part of the um, the tender submission to ensure that they they have that information in place at, at the time of tendering for the works. Tony, yeah, is there anything to, from your side you want to add? So just to add to that, Joe, um, um, RAP is a pretty mature product here in Victoria and you can see those specification requirements in there. So all of the major suppliers will will um, be supplying asphalt with wrap uh, and if they do so into any uh, um, Victorian government project work uh, they'll be required to meet the requirements of the specification which uh, which does require a wrap management plan amongst other things so um, at the time of um, at the time of um, um, uh, procurement there's every opportunity to uh, to get to understand that what we're doing, um, both through Ecologic and through the Department of Transport and, and with ARB as well, is looking at how we um, how we uh, go from where our current compliance level is to beyond compliance. Uh, for example, in the Morley Alley um, uh, example I gave earlier, to see how far we can go with with uh, maximising or optimising the use of RAP um, in all of our projects. Thanks, Tony. We have another question, and this is from Stephen, and they have asked, a batch plant can use a high proportion of wrap if they heat the virgin aggregate well above 200 degrees. Not good practice, but does a buyer know this? MRWA specifies a tent limit for heating virgin ags to address this. Thank you for thank you for that feedback. Yes, um, yeah. So I mean, like we mentioned previously, that um, different plants have different mechanisms of how to introduce that wrap, and and they do have have limitations. So it's just about um, understanding the plant, its capability, and and making sure you're operating within those within those limits. But there is opportunities. In the end, it, it's all about how managing the um, the, the process and the outcome. And if you can find a way to to manage that appropriately um, through modifications, then then that's that's possible. 
Thanks, Joe. We've got a question from David and they have asked, is the current recycling rate of RAP sufficient, i.e. are RAP stockpiles in the industry manageable or growing? Penny, is that something you would like to, to comment on? Um, I, look, you know, I, I think uh, the, the people who will know that best, obviously, are the, uh, are the producers and manufacturers who will understand how their stockpiles are, um, are what position their stockpiles are in and, um, and, you know, how much they're using, if you like that. So that supply and demand type approach, um, they'll be managing actively. I think it is worth saying, though, that uh, historically there's been a, um, um, a stockpiling of, of RAP um, as specifications and technology has um, has caught up and advanced so that uh, limits of uh, of wrap have increased they'll they'll reach a will reach a point at, at some stage where those things uh, where there's a balancing point between what we can win as wrap and and what needs to be supplied into the market i expect that there's a um I expect, I hope, that there's a, quite a, a backlog of wrap available for what will go into the big build, and the big build will chew up a fair bit of it, and there will continue to be wrap one and and stockpiled as we go along. I also know that, um, you know, in the past, in the, you know, I'm talking a, a fair while ago, um, you know, wrap was perhaps taken and used as road base or used as uh, used on top of subgrade or what have you as a way of using it up or used under a cycle path or wherever the case may be. Um, increasingly, people have recognised the value of that wrap and the highest order value of that wrap, as Joe spoke about earlier, is back into asphalt. So companies and, and industry has got much, uh, much smarter at, at winning and maintaining that wrap and putting it into, into its best use. So what the long-term sustainable percentage of wrap into, uh, into asphalt is, uh, I think still to be determined, but I think there's uh, there's enough of it around for us to uh, to uh, take advantage of now and to develop a sustainable use of it uh, going forward into the long term. If that helps. Perfect. Thanks, Tony. We have a question from Charmaine, and they have asked: Does the age of the asphalt being recycled have any impact on the rat mix? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the question. It does. Um, and that's why we do the, um, for your high percentages of wrap, that's why we do that um, viscosity testing on the, um, on the recovered material. So essentially, as the, um, as the asphalt stays in the road for longer, it's, it's exposed to the environment, so it continues to oxidize and, and age. And typically, the viscosity increases over time. So the viscosity is just a measure of of, of hardness of the binder, and, and and which can be used to indicate its brittleness and and cracking potential. So yes, as as um, as it's left longer in the road, the viscosity increases. But that's why we do the binder char characterization testing to determine the viscosity of that wrap binder, combined with the com viscosity of the new binder we then determine a new viscosity for the combined product and that's what we um, use for our design moving forward so yes very important to consider and and you need to account for that specifically at your high percentages wrap yeah that's and just great. to add to that so just to add to that again with, with joe um so there are different um there are different levels of hardness of virgin binder um, um, some softer ones and some harder ones, and so it's getting that blended uh, product to um, to meet the, the the ultimate bind of viscosity that we're that that a particular product is looking for, and so you do need to uh, understand what the uh, what the viscosity of the wrap is uh, to be able to select the right virgin binder to blend with it. That's right, and and just to add on to that, so obviously your your wrap viscosity is 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 fixed because that's the viscosity of the recovered material. Um, you have the opportunity to change your, um, like Tony suggested, your your new binder. Um, so instead of using say a C320, um, you can downgrade um, your binder to a C170 with a lower viscosity to account for that increased viscosity of the wrap. So there's changes you can make to your virgin binder, and then there's also opportunities to potentially add some rejuvenating agents and, and the like to, to get it within that target viscosity. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. 
We've got a question from Stephen and they have asked, at what percentage wrap should we consider using a rejuvenator or heating the wrap to get better mobilisation of the wrap binder? And whether we have an effective specie for rejuvenator? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for that question. Look, in terms of, I'll, I'll start off with the with the latter and um, do we have a, a, a specification for rejuvenating agents? Um, no, at the moment we don't have a, a standardized specification. I know it's something that, that industry um, is looking at developing, so there's, there's most definitely a need for that. Um, important to consider with rejuvenating agents is whether um, you know, to ensure that it does perform the function it's intended to. It's not just there to lower the viscosity of the combined binder. It's also there to um, to rejuvenate and put back some of those um, um, uh, more aromatic type um, compounds that we've lost during the aging process. So it's appropriate to um, to to um, or it's important to use appropriate um, rejuvenators to to fulfil that task. So yes, unfortunately at the moment we don't have a, a specification for for it, but it is something that industry is is looking at at developing. Thanks, I think that Joe. that covers that. In, um, in terms of the upper limit, um, look, I mean. It, it it does depend on on your um your target viscosity for your um for your bitumen blend and the viscosity of your wrap so if if you can achieve it by purely making a a um, downgrade in your viscosity of your base binder then that's possible and if you then still can't achieve it then you need to start considering whether you need to either reduce the um, percentage of wrap um or look at introducing alternatives such as um, rejuvenating agents. So I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a specific upper limit because it, it does depend on, on your percent, on, 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 on your base binder as well as your wrap binder. Thanks Joe. We've got a question from Diana and they have asked which one do you think is the most crucial parameter from wrap that affects field performance? Look, um, the most critical um, parameter is is the viscosity, um, because and, and look, and, and again, this is for your higher percentages of wrap. I should qualify that because at your lower percentages, typically below fifteen percent, um, we know that it doesn't have such a big influence. Um, but at your higher percentages, um, viscosity is, is is important. It's also um, important to know your grading of your wrap. So your aggregate grading as well as your binder content, because you're adding it to a new asphalt mixture, um, um, you need to be able to account for that grading of the aggregate as well as the existing binder content that's already on on that wrap. So um, grading and binder content is is important to know, and you need to account for that. But in terms of long-term performance, um, it would be uh, the viscosity at at the moment that that we need to control. Yeah, look, and I'd, I'd um, yeah, you know, just support that. It, it, the binder is the critical um, is the critical driver of, of performance in this case. Here, the aggregates uh, are important, and the grading is important to get the get the end grading right. Again, that's a a, a blending and a balancing act. Um, there's obviously some strength characteristics out of the aggregates and what have you that are important, but um, um, but given that they're already an existing aggregate that has uh, that has worked and has come from come from um, a required specified source, the, the most important piece is definitely the binder. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, combined binder is the critical element. It's probably just worth adding as well that, I mean, there's there's been a lot of work that's been done in the past in terms of uh, validating the performance of, of uh, wrap mixes with, with high percentages of wrap and, and the information um, or, or, the, or the work done to date all indicate that if you if you account for that increased viscosity um, during your design process, you shouldn't see any um, adverse impacts on your long-term performance. So you get comparable conformance as long as you account for that um, change in binder properties, which again, there's, there's standardized, pro standardized procedures to do that. Um, that's That's been validated. Great. Thanks, Joe. We've got a question from Sarah and they've asked, can you use wrap in warm mix asphalt? 
Um, I'm going to have a crack first. I think it's um, um, it's ideal in warm mix asphalt. In fact, um, um, it's the place where it it actually adds some uh, some advantages because uh, um, often uh, the binder oxidizes um, very quickly in that uh, initial heating process where where um, where because it's because of the manufacturing process uh, the binder is is open to it can be open to a, a bit of atmospheric sort of um, um, uh, exposure that that tends to age it pretty quickly and it's also done at pretty high temperatures so by using warm asphalt you're actually keeping the temperatures a little lower um, and you're less aging the the product as it's being manufactured so warm asphalt is a facilitator of, uh, of using wrap uh, some people see might think of it as an inhibitor it's actually the opposite I think yeah and, and by the way, warm yeah. asphalt is a, is a great technology that we don't make enough use of um, as yet, and, and that change needs to come as well. Yeah, fully Tony, support that. We have a question from Anan, and they have asked thoughts on wrap as a straight substitute for base course or sub base layer in a granular pavement. As a straight substitute, look. Um, there's some things to consider when when you do that because essentially um, it, it it will change the the behavior of that of of that layer. Um, if you leave wrap and and Stephen alluded to it in his in his slides that if you leave wrap say on a stockpile, it hardens over time, it binds up, and 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 it and 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 it becomes semi bound again. So. Um, you have to be conscious of of replacing um, an unbound material with a material that will potentially harden up over time again, in terms of what that would mean for the behaviour of your pavement. So it it will function differently um, as to a um, as to an unbound pavement material. Uh, we're talking about now, you know, fully substitution. Um, as you can see in the specifications, uh, uh, the Department of Transport allows up to 50% in the lower layers. So you can still um, substitute a significant proportion um, lower down on your pavement structure, but um, you have to be um, considering the the impact on the behaviour of that of of that pavement structure as a whole. Um, so generally, we don't use it as a hundred percent substitution. Yeah, and look, and, uh, look uh, and I guess that's the technical side of it. Just uh, just. Just going back to what Joe said earlier about using it for its highest order and highest order value, um, mm -hmm. both from an economic and a sustainability perspective, um, the best use of wrap is back into uh, recycled asphalt or reclaimed asphalt um, because of the binder, because of the value of that binder. And the binder is a value as a binder, which is a binder in asphalt. So um, using it in lower layers, really should only be, con or in, as a base course or material of any sort, should really only be considered when it's absolutely not possible to take that material and put it back through uh, an existing asphalt plant. So perhaps if you're in, in rural area, regional areas or rural areas where you where you win some of this product uh, out of a town or what have you, and there isn't an, uh, an asphalt plant that can, that can process it, a little pretty rare occurrence, I think, um, you know, you would only use it in circumstances like that. Um, if possible, so you should make every effort to um, to take it back as a re reclaimed asphalt product with, wherever possible. Yeah, just on that as well. Um, further to my previous comment is um, the other thing to consider with the wrap as as an unbound or, or as a full substitution for unbound granular materials is the is the grading. So that's why we generally do blend it with with um, with natural or, or crushed materials because um, to introduce more of that finer particle to get more of a continuous grading which you might not necessarily get out of a single um, sourced wrap. Thanks Joe. We've got a question from Bernadette and they've asked is any research into pulverising and mixing wrap on site being considered to further reduce production cost? Yes, uh, so I did allude to um, to those technologies earlier. So there's a couple of um, in situ um, ways to do that. Not commonly being done done in Australia um, is both hot in place or cold in place um, recycling. 
So it's essentially um, in the hot process, it's essentially um, um, ripping that, that existing asphalt, scarifying and adding um, new binder to it and recompact it all in one process. Um, and the cold in situ um, process is very similar, but instead of using a hot binder, you'd, you'd go for a, a cold technology like an emulsion or a foam bitumen. So they, they, um, those technologies um, are available, but not common um, mm. locally. Tony, you want to add something yeah, yeah, to that? that? Look, that that hot in place uh, asphalt recycling was um, was being done um, probably in the 2000s. Um, it's it's waned, I think, uh, uh, as re uh, really probably from commercial and and practical uh, applicability um, approach. Um, if you Google it, you'll see it, it looks quite impressive. But it's it's usually quite a long train of of uh, of, of Machinery, if you like, something to warm, something to warm up, like a hairdryer, or something to warm up the uh, uh, the asphalt that's existing there, and then something to peel it up, throw it back over the back, maybe add a rejuvenating agent or a little bit of fresh asphalt to it to, to liven it up, and then put it back through a paver that's in a train, and then lay it out the back again. So it really lends itself to um, arterial or freeway type projects um, rather than any suburban or urban type uh, application. And and um, that technology is available. Um, it's probably used a bit in in Europe. Um, we don't see a lot of here um, uh, as yet. It's going to take a, um, someone with um, with some intentionality to give it a commercial crack to uh, to bring it back again. I would think. Thanks, Tony. We've got a question from Mitchell, and they have asked. Thanks for the presentation. Well done. I've got a question for Joe. You identified that further testing is requ required to identify the interaction between wrap and virgin binder for proportions over 15%. Just wondering how the wrap binder interacts with the virgin binder during mixing. Does the wrap binder soften on the aggregate surface and mix consistently with the new, new virgin binder or does it form small pockets of oxycyte bitumen within the virgin material? Look, um yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, the work done to date is all supports that there's, there's a significant amount of blending that does occur. So you're right there um, when, when you say that the um, the wrap binder softens during the, the uh, manufacturing process. And Stephen mentioned that um, you achieve that by superheating your, your virgin aggregate. And when it comes in co contact with your wrap, it softens that um, wrap binder and that um, blending and, and interaction does occur um, between your wrap binder and your and your virgin binder. Thanks Joe. We've got another question from Angela and they have asked a high percentage GES of wrap only used in lower layers of asphalt rather than wearing courses? Thank you. For that, Tony, you wanna you wanna touch on that? Um, uh, the uh, the specifications usually um, allow higher percentages of of wrap in the uh, in the lower courses. Um, uh, there's still wrap. Uh, that's great. Uh, still wrap allowable in in the wearing course. Those asphalt type H and and what have you uh, do have ten percent. And you'll see uh, type SF, which is the very bottom layer, has thirty percent allowable there. Um, in part, that's because usually there's a very um, a larger aggregate, and a, and those lower layers are typically thicker than the um, than uh, than the upper layers. So you can uh, blend um, mm. uh, wrap that might have 20 millimeter aggregate in it um, more easily into the into the bigger layers. However, having said that. Um, <clears throat> You know there is uh, every opportunity to actually put more wrap into the upper layers, providing you can uh, demonstrate uh, adequate performance. I think the upper layer also has, um, you know, also is is critical in terms of um, um, ensuring that there's um, a, a uniform pavement, that it's watertight, and that it's rut resistant, if you like. So some of those things play into the more conservative approach on. How much recycling goes into, uh, how much reclaimed asphalt goes into those courses? Uh, but I'm not a technical guy, Joe. You can you can maybe add to that, if like or yeah, confirm. No, that, absolutely, no. That, 
Absolutely. Now that that covers it very well. Thanks, Tony. So as you can see on the slide here, um, you know, so they do allow up to about 20% in, in in your wearing courses, but traditionally the higher percentage is down down lower, and that's that's more um, like Tony alluded to, as your your wearing course is is the critical one that's um, directly into contact with the environment, uh, the vehicle tires, and and all that. So. And, and it's a thinner layer, um, so it's um, yeah, that, that's mainly the reason behind that. But again, if if, if you design your your mix appropriately and you account for that and you do your necessary performance tests, then then it's um, certainly something to consider um, higher percentages. Yeah, and I think that's been done in sort of trials, perhaps in in less risky type environments with local government and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Joe. We've got a question from Lou, and they have asked: Is the mixed design of mixtures with wrap is similar to virgin mixes? Is there any difference in the optimum binder content or air void content design, like four uh, percent? Look, now the mix design requirements is is, is essentially um, the same in terms of the overall mix design requirements. It's just the um, your binder. Um, properties that um, that do change. So in terms of void, target voids and those things, there's, there's, there's no change now. No worries. Thanks, Joe. We've got another question from Diana and they have asked, what do you think about the incorporation of other materials into asphalt mixtures such as plastic and how this might affect the reuse of wrap in the future? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that, that's a very good question, and it's something that, um, as an industry, we've been we've been talking about and grappling with because we we've reached a stage now where we're starting to combine recycled materials and different materials in into the same mix. So um, it's not necessarily just wrap anymore. It can be wrap and rubber, or it can be glass and rubber, or glass and wrap. And so there's all different permutations. So as you can imagine, um, it's a challenge for for specifications and more your prescriptive type of specifications to keep up with with how to deal with that. So um, from a personal point of view, um, I and we just spoke about this previously, me and Tony, um, before the webinar is, um, you know, a strong supporter of performance related specifications to to essentially move towards a stage where as long as we can control and ensure the performance of the end product, it doesn't really matter too much what's what's in it. Now that's a very broad statement, and uh, and and that. So um, you, we need to have confidence in the performance and how we go about measuring that performance and that. Um, but that's the key to moving forward: performance-related specifications. Um, your question about future recyclability, um, that is absolutely critical because at the moment, like we mentioned, asphalt is a hundred percent recyclable. Not many construction uh, materials can can make that claim at the moment. So whatever we do um, in future asphalt mixes, um, whatever we add to future asphalt mixes, um, we need to ensure that that remains the same, that we can continue to recycle that material. Um, so it is um, something to consider when when deciding or uh, whether you're going to allow. Um, whatever new material in into your asphalt is whether you can then in future recycle that continue to recycle that asphalt um, in terms of plastic specific there's a lot of work happening within the industry at the moment looking at those issues specifically um, so that's that's work in progress yeah and if you could imagine a, a perfect world for ecology given what it's its goals are, it would be to incorporate um, maximum values of wrap, to incorporate uh, crushed glass in lieu of sand, um, to to invite um, rubber tyres and plastic, soft plastic waste into the into the binder and to be able to recycle that uh, time and time again. Um, one thing I know a little bit about uh, in, in with bitumen is it's a pretty welcoming product and uh, it, it, it tends to work pretty well with anything that it can glue to and it will and things like plastics and 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 rubber tires and and wrap for that matter um, because you're heating it um, that those things tend to um, blend and and become uh, morph into one if you like so 
see some future and some uh, opportunity with it, but there is certainly um, a body of work that's um, that needs to continue to be done to sort of prove all that up uh, over time. Um, and that performance-based approach is, is um, you know, is a is a way of of achieving those outcomes as well. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Joe. So we've hit right on twelve. Uh, sorry, one o'clock. So I think it'll be best to wrap it up. So thank you to our presenters today, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. We hope to see you all at our next webinar, Recycle Glass Masterclass, on the twenty eighth of October at twelve pm. Thanks, everybody, for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.